Church is Noongar for good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adam Ford, and I'm a Noongar, a mixed Anglo man who is currently interning here at the UQ Art Museum, having just completed my Bachelor of Arts, where I majored in art history. First off, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands in which we meet today, the Yagara and Turbal peoples here in Mianjin, and to the traditional owners of the lands from which our online audience join us. Sovereignty was never ceded, and on behalf of the UQ Art Museum, I pay respects to all mob for showing up and showing out, for surviving and for thriving. Welcome all to this event, to those with us in person, and to those of you who have joined us online. It's a pleasure to have you. Today's webinar event takes inspiration from the ABC program of the same name, You Can't Ask That. You Can't Ask That, more than a word, reconciliation takes action, is an opportunity to confront stereotypes, prejudices, bias, and discrimination head-on. Hosted on what is the last day of National Reconciliation Week and on the 29th anniversary of Mabo Day, today's webinar will tackle some hard-hitting questions when it comes to reconciliation, activism, taking action, and thinking about Indigenous pasts, presents, and futures. Joining me today to answer these hard-hitting questions are Professor Tracy Bunder, just want to give us a wave, Michael Ed, and Gordon Hookie. Thanks, guys. Professor Tracy Bunda is a Nui Waka Waka woman and the current director of, the, of academic programs at the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Unit, University of Queensland. Tracy has a well-established national and international reputation in Indigenous education. Her interests include race and the impacts of institutions on the lives of Aboriginal peoples, Indigenous women, and leadership. In 2021, Professor Bunda, Bunda is curating two publications that showcase UQ Indigenous student and staff voices. Looking forward to that one, let me trace. All right, Michael. Michael Ed is director of the UQ Anthropology Museum and an ARC Research Fellow. He has worked in the area of Aboriginal arts and cultural heritage since 1985, maintaining an interest in docu documenting aspects of urban Aboriginal history and culture. In 1996, he established Kiara Press, an independent publishing house producing over 35 books. He has curated over 30 exhibitions and has been involved in numerous projects in the area of art, history, and research. Keep him busy. All right, Gordon. Gordon Hookie is a current member of the Aboriginal Artist Collective Proper Now, which you can see here around us today. Hookie was born in Cloncurry, Queensland. He lives and works in Brisbane and belongs to the Wan Yi and Wan Jiminjin peoples. Hooky is well known for his use of humour, irony and wit to provoke and challenge the status quo. Along with his many other works in the exhibition A Current Affair, Hooky includes large scale protest banners which make timely statements of resistance, which you might be able to see behind me. Hooky's work is held in major collections within Australia, including the Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art, University of Queensland Art Museum, the Art Gallery of Western Australia, National Gallery of Australia, the Australian National University, and National Gallery of Victoria. Where aren't you at? <laughs> <laughs> All right, before we begin, um, just a quick housekeeping. Uh, for those joining us online, we encourage you to ask questions over the course of the live stream, but please know that we received a ton of questions and that we probably won't be able to get through them all. For our physical audience, please save questions to the end, time permitting, of course. With that out of the way, let's jump into it. All right, let's straight away. Did saying sorry on sorry day really make a difference? And this is open to any of you. Go on. Oh, I'm to go first. Yeah, go uh, on. Lamb to the <laughs> uh, well, well, to me, uh, personally, um, I, I don't believe in it. That's personal. Um, simply because of... Uh, all the, demo, uh, all the vital statistics, you know, such as health, education, uh, deaths in custody, um, very little change, you know, since that day that uh, you know, Kevin Rudd, mm. sometimes I say Philip Ruddick because the name is so similar, <laughs> similar but Kevin Rudd, uh, you know, from that day when he said that. Mm. But on another level, I feel that it's of its time as well uh, because, um, you know, for those that have suffered trauma as a result of that, and those that are, you know, struggling every day, just to hear that um, in Parliament House, um, the way it did, it created, you know, an outburst of emotions and, and, and feelings. And for me to see that, I would say that, you know, it, it, it was worthwhile. Um, but 
I also feel that, you know, it was said in a way uh, because the previous, previous government, John Howard, did not say it. And it could be that knee-jerk reaction. But well, he didn't do it, so let's us do it, something that mm. he didn't do. Um, I'm glad that it happened, especially seeing that day when John Howard addressed a whole forum of uh, people that were traumatised or, or stolen, you know, from, from their mob. When he stood there and shook his fist at them, banged the rostrum and, you know, speaking like a dictator. Carried on, yeah. And those Murray, or all those people then got up and turned their backs. To me, mm. that was uh, the most powerful thing in regards to this sorry business. And then sorry came after that. Mm. There's a sense that on the day when um, Rudd gave the apology in the way in which he did, it was, I, I was surprised by the depth of that apology and uh, particularly given the history prior to that. <clears throat> and I can recall it because um, I kept Nyoka home from school and I, I can also recall writing a letter to the school principal explaining why I kept Nyoka home from school and then the next day the school principal made the whole school watch the, the recorded apology. And I asked Nyoka to stay home and watch it because, um, you know, she embodied her grandmother and I wanted her to um, get a sense of the depth of what mm. had happened to um, her grandmother. Um, sorry doesn't, it's not the corrective, it's not the corrective in uh, the total corrective. Um, it's a beginning and there is just so much work to do within this country. Uh, for any of you who've, who've heard me speak before, I'm constantly amazed that in 2021 that we are living in a country really that doesn't have um, a mature sense of uh, race, of understanding race. Um, and until it does, we're not going to be able to um, address many of the the critical issues that, that Gordon pointed to in terms of, um, you know, making the difference in our everyday lives and particularly for those members of our communities who are, vul are vulnerable. So um, um, it was really important that it was set. Uh, it's an important first step, um, but I think, um, I think anyone who is an ally with Indigenous people will know that there is um, much, much work much to be done. Much more to do. do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's good that Gordon raised the issue of the, of, of the debacle of, of John Howard at the Reconciliation Conference in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. And that was a sad end, you know, that period, 95, the Reconciliation Movement period of 95 to 2000, where people, all over Australia put in a huge effort to discuss reconciliation, discuss Aboriginal yep. culture. So many white people in that, in that five year period got to meet and talk to Aboriginal mm -hmm. people for the first time ever. So an incredible amount of good came out of that reconciliation movement. Mm. And, and then the, the reconciliation conference in Melbourne was a, was a you know, heading to the end of that, that era. Sorry, just, yeah, as I said, you know, the, the 95 to 2000 period and, and John Howard's um, sad performance in Melbourne, yeah, was a sad end to, to a, it was a missed opportunity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then of course, Kevin Rudd, um, you know, years later took that opportunity and, and it was a huge event. And as Tracy said, school children mm -hmm. all over Australia watched it. It was a, um, it made stolen generation people feel feel good, mm. finally, about some of the bad things that's happened in their lives. Yeah. And it also made a lot of white people feel good and free of guilt in some yep. ways. And mm. I, 
I guess I sort of ask the question now, um, is what's more important, making white Australia feel good <laughs> about Aboriginal culture? Mm. And if, if, if those safe opportunities to feel good are there, mm. will people actually ask the hard questions mm. like sovereignty, mm. Um, mm. land rights, mm. all types of other rights? Um, so, so yeah, are the hard questions being asked? Mm. Yeah, and I guess with those hard questions, it opens up to the next question. Um, what does reconciliation mean to you personally? Like, what would that look mm. like to you? How does it contain those difficult kind of mm. conundrums? Can I have a crack? Can I have a crack? Yeah, yeah okay, please. Thanks, yes. Tom. Um, look, I'm part, um, um, historically I'm part of that, that group that was quite dismissive of reconciliation. Um, and part of the reason for that was because I could see within the communities, within Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, every day the hard work that was being done um, in educating non-Indigenous people was taken up by Indigenous people. And that's an everyday labour for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. It's invisible and it's often unpaid work as well. And so often when we work in large institutions, uh, we've got two jobs. The job that, we're, um, that we uh, applied for, but there's this other job where we are educating non-Indigenous people all the time. And what happens is that leads to an exhaustion an exhaustion of engagement with non-Indigenous people who um, don't make the effort to be able to engage in their own education. And that exhaustion then leads to anger and rebuff of, of a process. A little bit older now and a little bit wiser. Um, and having listened to Megan Davis, Davis last fortnight with uh, her lecture about the Uluru Statement from the Heart. She said that in consultation with Ab Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, even those consulting groups were saying, we don't like the word reconciliation. But I suppose it's, it's a word that speaks to the agency of being able to come together. And irregardless of um, how successful RAP programs are being implemented within particularly large organisations, um, we do need to be able to have a process so that two sovereignties can live on the same land. Mm. And wrap for our audiences is reconciliation um, action plan. <coughs> I was wondering. Either of you want to jump in or should we jump to the next one? All right. How can society reconcile when so many people do not believe reconciliation is possible or necessary? Well, that's a hard one. Preempting what other people think. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. <coughs> but I think, yeah, I mean, there's obviously a huge amount of goodwill towards reconciliation mm -hmm. action plans. The, as I said, 95 to 2000 was the big era when Australia really learnt about this concept of reconciliation. And then, um, and I guess after that, it, you know, it's sort of after, sort of, yeah, I, and I guess the Kevin Rudd's apology was, a, was another major point yep. in bringing it to people's attention. And, and I, as I said, you know, there's that, that the biggest fear is, is just is the ticking of boxes and people having an easy way out to saying that mm. they understand Aboriginal culture because there's, they can name a tribe or do a Google and come up with the tribal name of yeah. the tribe who live where they live. Yeah. And, and then and, and having no understanding of how contested some of those names may be, mm. the, the conflicts within Aboriginal communities about 
names, mm. about words. And like your legacy is Norman Tyndale and people like that. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. Yeah. And Aboriginal people live and breathe those contestations about mm. about tribal identities and who comes from where. Yep. And yet you have this, you know, in a sense, a mainstream audience that just accepts whatever they find on Google. So, so to me, as a history professional, I mean, that's that is really my greatest fear is that people, mainstream Australia, is willing to accept a nice, safe version of Aboriginal culture, mm. rather than actually really learning about conflicts from the past, uh, modern politics, you know, within our Aboriginal society, you know, and the disagreements and how complex Aboriginal culture is. Oh, definitely. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I agree with what Michael and uh, Tracy were saying. Um, particularly uh, um, when Tracy mentioned that it could be very exhausting at times having to explain. Um, and, you know, we're kind of in the position where we are at that uh, interface where, where, the cult, where two cultures are coming together, a non-Aboriginal and Aboriginal culture. And it's almost like this reconciliation concept or idea, the onus is put on us. Mm. Who's when, reconciling? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. When really, um, we as a people, we don't really have anything to reconcile with uh, the invading cultures. Those invading cultures, th you, they have to do all the work. You know, uh, my view uh, overall is, is could be uh, deemed a little bit extreme because, really, as a people, as a nation, um, I feel as as blackfella, we really can't settle for anything less than what we've had hmm. prior to invasion. Now that is extreme, but that just goes to show how much work you white fellas have to do. You know, um, you know, like I know that, you know, it, it can start with little steps and little things and, and improvements, but uh, uh, at the moment when I see, you know, the news and what's happening, when I go home, and I see very little that had changed in my community um, in regards to these things that we are talking about, then, um, um, you know, I do feel I'm, I'm optimistic that things can happen, but sadly not too much, uh, if you know what I mean. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Mm. All right, with the next question, um, keeping in mind the theme is taking action more than just a word. Is, are there any expectations within Aboriginal communities that you have to be an activist and always have to be ready to protest? Um, I don't know that we can um, speak for communities. We can speak for our experience. Absolutely. Yeah, within those communities. Identification as an Aboriginal person is really um, complex, particularly because it collided um, with colonisation. So um, expressions of Aboriginality um, are varied, you know. And I think that sort of talks to the complexity, but it also should be complex because um, we are people. And so you have what society might think of as uh, radicals who um, engage in protest movements. Um, but we, as just as much as um, non-Indigenous society, we also have conservatives. <laughs> yeah. mm. You know, we have conservative blackfellas and, um, and we have people who are in the middle of that as well. Um, so I think, I think it's not the measure of Aboriginality um, and different communities would deem those measures um, in different ways and then, as Michael said, be contested about all of that as well. So um, that one's not really easily no. answerable. You can't ask that. <laughs> mm. I, th I think we always have to praise the good work of radical Mm -hmm. activism. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, radical activists have done so much good. I think Gordon, Tracy, myself, you know, we, st we entered tertiary education thanks to radical activities mm. from 
good radical people in the 60s and the 70s. They opened the opportunities for us, so we yeah. have to be grateful. But also, you know, I come from a very conservative family yeah. where, you know, conservatism has enabled my family to stay in our traditional country because, you know, the other, the other option mm. was, was to be sent off to a mission or a reserve. Yeah. Mm. So, so there's a place for both yeah. radicals and conservatives. Mm. That's interesting, Michael. I come from a really radical family. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, um, had, the, had the benefit of seeing my old, my old people um, bite china teacups when they were having their cup of tea because we live in we lived in the same town as Pauline Hanson no. <laughs> with the rise of Hansonism which just used to make them wild you know and you know um, those punitive actions against Aboriginal people you know um, we have stories in my family where where um, you know my mom was being punished when she was seven years of age because she was talking back and acting back against yeah. Yeah. Indigenous people, yeah. Yeah. Uh, against the power of, of those institutions. Yeah, yeah I, I just think we've got, you know, blackfellas working very hard, you know, on all levels of our communities uh, as well, like uh, uh, my grandmother, for instance, um, uh, well, I've had a lot, of, I've got a lot of uncles, basically, and a lot of them were, um, were stock workers yeah. and uh, you know they'd just go bush for months then come home all cashed up and then spent you know the next three months uh, drunk basically you know and my grandmother used to look after all the drunks but not only that all their friends as well and I mean that work that, that she had done um, you know it, it goes unnoticed but yeah. there's a whole lot of um, blackfellas within our community that are, that are doing things that, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, taking kids to school uh, or, or, or preparing lunches and, you know, on many different levels. Mm. And, mm. and those things, they do make a big, big difference, you know, um, mm. a, as well. You know, not only um, the blackfellas that are in the street uh, marching, um, not only, uh, you know, the blackfellas that are making art, that are, that are putting out there for people to see, but, um, we're well supported yeah. by those that um, are speaking the same language that we are speaking, that are that are uh, uh, that are, are, are telling us things about our own people. You know, um, for us to to yeah. try and do yeah. things that can make yeah. make it better, not only for present generation but future, also for those that are that are come yeah. afterwards. Now, for the audience, um, Tracy, Michael, and Gordy have a bit of a connection to UQ, uh, tertiary correction, uh, connection. What was the political climate of UQ like in the 1980s and 1990s, and what has changed? Just thinking here about the Joe Bioki Peterson honorary in this space, uh, the Springbok protests, things like that. What was what was it like? I think first, we have to. I think we have to thank Joe Bioki Peterson. I think he created a, a wonderful political climate. Legacy. Legacy <laughs> that produced wonderful artists like Gordon and wonderful academics like Tracy. So, you know, some good came out of that. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember, I can remember. Did, did you ever go into town? into the protests in town in George Street and stuff. Oh, we all did. Yeah, yeah, I can remember, Park, yeah. I can remember yeah. the gates of, of, of Parliament House coming down, you know, and yeah. the mob climbing over onto the other side of the, the gate and stuff and um, chanting down uh, <laughs> Queen Street and stuff. Yeah, yeah, no, it was good in that, you know, for us, we used to have our happy hours on the sixth floor of, uh, what was that building? The Gordon, Gordon Greenwood. Greenwood. Yeah, yeah, as well. And the wonderful thing about that is, uh, you know, we had the radio station that was just down the, in the next building uh, near Chanel Theatre. And, uh, and a lot of people from the community would, would come to those, those happy hours. And, and not only that, like, you know, just in the common room with the discussions, uh, we would know when things had happened, uh, be it were Rumpy Band playing or Mop yeah, on the drop yeah. Dropouts playing there or, or anything that's happened at Musgrave Park. So, so when there was a march, you know, be they legal or illegal, uh, a lot of the students back then were ready and prepared and would tell each other 
and uh, uh, we would go there. But also, you know, if, if there was just a party in the community somewhere, you'd turn up and uh, there'd be um, blackfellas, you know, from, you know, studying here that'd be there just uh, having a good time with each other. Yeah. And not only like, we've kind of formed a basis of friends as well, you know, like we were just saying before we come here, well, me and Michael started the same year. Um, the same and we were the, Yeah, <laughs> we were the only tradies that were in the whole group of uh, kids with that just leaving school. And then Tracy, I met Tracy, uh, we used to play squash together. Uh, you wouldn't think it, would you? <laughs> but, you know, uh, uh, so, so having that friendship, and I noticed too, all that friendship that we've had, it continued, you know, in, through the, uh, you know, throughout the community, when you look at uh, some of the Murrays and Blackfellas that are working in organisations, mm. uh, not only in Queensland, but also interstate, you know, mm. uh, they have come through the system that I suppose was re reactionary to the mm. Bialke Peterson regime mm. and Blackfellas that are working in organisations, Sydney, Melbourne, even in Adelaide, they have a political now, so I think that. Um, could only exist from what we've been through mm. here as, mm. a, as a mob, yeah. I, I'm really appreciative of that particular time. Mm. Um, I think it made me um, more astute politically um, and it, um, um, it seemed natural and normal that you, know, you, had, a, you had a platform as Aboriginal people to, to speak. I also want to pay homage to the generation before yeah. Can I just add a corrective? I came to University of Queensland, but I don't think I studied. I know I definitely <laughs> left. <laughs> these, two, these two finished with a degree I didn't. Um, <laughs> but um, the generation before us, you know, was um, uh, Lillian Holt. Um, uh, you know, and Lillian went on uh, to work at the Aboriginal Community College in, in Adelaide. And, you know, they were, they were pivotal to that um, uh, political uh, protest movement as well, you know, her generation. Um, so I just wanted to pay homage there yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, next question, and I did like this one. What role do new migrants who come to this country play in reconciliation? Mm. And I've never thought about it in that way. I've never mm. thought of that question before. I think one thing is that I think particularly being young growing up on the Gold Coast, it was a, a very white part of Australia. Mm -hmm. There was not many brown faces. Mm -hmm. That's certainly changed for the Gold Coast, it's changed for Brisbane, it's changed for most of Australia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think, I guess one of the great things about immigrants coming to Australia is many of them are not white. So it sort of changes the whole mm. colour mm. of this country. I think it, in, a, in, in time it would really significantly change the, the way Australia sees itself. Mm. We'll play soccer and not rugby league. Oh, get out. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, um, Gordon, do you mind if I say something oh, no, about... Please, <laughs> um, one of the things that... Um, I think there's this sort of um, pressure to assimilate mm -hmm. for the migrant population. Um, we saw that with uh, first wave, second wave migrants, um, you know, um, from Europe, uh, post-war. Uh, we saw that with the Vietnamese community um, and we see it with, um, uh, you know, the pressure upon the Muslim community and um, now some of our, our African communities. I'm really interested why there's no conversations between those communities and Aboriginal communities. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> because we are all brown people together. Yeah. Yeah. And I would like to be able to have those conversations. Um, but we haven't actively engaged um, to build a coalition um, that possibly in the future could be a very powerful voting bloc um, in this country, but also a coalition that um, is built from understanding what it means to be dispossessed um, 
um, to live with violence, yeah. um, to be, uh, you know, to have your country taken from you. Um, you know, those conversations aren't happening. And I, 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 to tell you the truth, I yearn for those conversations. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's funny that the whole notion of uh, migrants, um, if you're not Aboriginal or First Nation, you are a migrant. Um, and it's, you know, look at it like us being here first, and then you've got this big wave of Anglo, um, you know, from, from Britain, England, and then all subsequent thereafter other waves of immigrants coming here. And uh, each one of those waves of immigrants, they seem to have uh, grabbed or entrenched an ec economic foothold in the mm. system and society that was here. And uh, I mean, we as a people, we've had our structure and health system here basically right from the be beginning of time. And even to this day, that is still not, not recognised. I mean, uh, you've had, you know, uh, governments wanting to have a, you know, English test and, uh, and a cultural test and all that, you know, before, uh, you know, they get citizenship and all this and there's questions, all that, you know. Um, really, uh, to come to this country, there should be a process of uh, Aboriginalisation, really, mm -hmm. where you see this country and you see the people through Aboriginal eyes. Now, that, that's a little bit extreme to where we're at and stuff mm. like that, but uh, I always feel what we have to aim for is something that is so high that if we only get a little bit, it's um, a little bit meaningful. So, you know, for me, each wave of immigrant, each wave of migrant has to be Aboriginalised, I feel. Yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, I know that uh, in practical terms, um, it may not be achievable, but we have to, oh, well, I feel that uh, perhaps uh, yous have to make it achievable, the migrants, the immigrants have to make it achievable as to what we want. But that's the sort of innovative thinking that's required for the hard questions that Michael talks about. Mm. Yeah. And I, I think this is a good segue, thinking yeah. about Indigenous futures with reconcil reconciliation, but Thinking about the past, how does our understanding of intergenerational trauma play into how we approach reconciliation? That's a loaded one. Say it again. How does our understanding of intergenerational trauma play into how we approach reconciliation? So I guess maybe how do our past kind of, how do we, do we ever leave the past behind? Do we bring it with us? Mm. The way in which, the way in which you are um, socially conceived as an Aboriginal person, there's no denying that you carry that past with you, and um, there are many things in my family that I don't necessarily want forgotten. Mm. You know, I want to be able to um, maintain the memory of that. That is that in itself is the act of, of history and keep keeping, you know, keeping that knowledge. Um, <clears throat> I spoke before about uh, the Uluru Statement from the heart and one of the objectives out of that Uluru Statement um, is to have truth telling within this country. And that I think will be really important in terms of um, healing for both, um, uh, no, mainly for Aboriginal mm. people. I suppose the question is, if we tell the truth, are white people able to hear? Yeah, it's like um, owning everything, everything that's happened to us uh, as a people, generations had gone past. Uh, 
uh, you know, one of the greatest uh, things that I've seen with trauma is uh, a denial of some kind of things that happened in our past. And then um, it surfaces in an uncontrolled way and it just, you know, spirals into more um, perhaps, you know, social despair or, or whatever. But for us to have that support where we can own and be honest with what Tracy was saying of things that had happened, um, but not only our people, um, to be honest about that, to be honest about ourselves, the, the perpetrators, um, the, the generations from those who, who have gains from those uh, atrocities and as well that cause so much pain and despair on us, they have to own their history as well, you know, yeah. as well, and perhaps uh, compensate for what had happened because uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, the majority of Australia are the direct beneficiaries from those very brutal atrocities. All that the, the the despair, the um, those things that, that that were mentioned in the in the question, and then again, you know, the word reconciliation is framed again where the onus is on us, you know, just in that question, in it in itself uh, as well. Yeah, I saw on social media the other day the question was. Black fella. Well, why are we reconciling? What do we have to reconcile? Mm. You're the ones that would have to mm. reconcile with yeah. what mm. you've done. So mm. I think that's a good one. And it ties into the next question. How can Indigenous Australians thrive in the current state of the country or will they need full access to their lands to self-govern? Bit of a bit of a mix up word one. So I think about land rights and self-governing and can Aboriginal people ever achieve self-governance until that happens? I think even with tying this in with the previous question about <coughs> past government policy, past trauma that many Aboriginal, many, many Aboriginal families have suffered because of government intervention and government policies. And those, those effects, denial to economic, quite often, yeah, the den blatant denial of economic opportunities to yeah. Aboriginal people has meant people being um, removed from their traditional country, sent to missions and reserves, and then the ongoing consequences of that, of, of the trauma that's, that's, that's has previous, been caused by previous policies. And to a degree, still, trauma still being caused by current policies mm. as well. Mm. Yeah. Then on the other hand, you've got some Aboriginal families that were fortunate to stay on country, and largely those families, quite often those families survived by being conservative, as we discussed before, yep. conforming, and in a sense, outwardly losing aspects of culture so to white head, society. A bit head mm. down, tail up kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. concentrating on working, concentrating yep. on, if they're fortunate, buying land, fortunate, just, just struggling for privileges, like sending their children to school, privileges like being able to go to a pub and have a beer on a Friday mm. night, mm. privileges of having a job and getting paid a decent wage. So. You know, and again, it's conservatism that's, that's enabled many families um, to achieve that, but at a cost. And as I said, it could be language, culture, other things, but these families have made a decision to stay on country, and they have. Yeah. So it's this, you, you can never, you, you know, the, so Aboriginal people have made incredible political decisions to stay on country. So country is absolutely important. Good. And, and I think quite often people overlook the, the importance of that to, to even the most urban Aboriginal communities. Land is still important. Yeah. Mm. Mm. All right. Should you always introduce an Aboriginal person by their tribe? And what about other honorifics such as auntie, uncle, etc.? Maybe if we could take it from a non-Indigenous person or perhaps also an Indigenous person that you don't really know, how, does it, how would it work for you? <laughs> I, I'm in that um, I'm in that very strange position where um, people call me auntie, and I think it's because I have grey hair. <laughs> 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 and I think it's because people believe that they're performing an honorific to me. Right. You know, yeah. um, <clears throat> when I talked about exhaustion before. Um, Part of my exhaustion is telling people, no, you don't have to call me Arnie, you can just call me Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> and after a while, I've just given up. <laughs> um, look, 
Um, I understand that that is respectful. Um, I was listening to uh, my colleague, Ree Saunders. Saunders yeah. uh, she was in a symposium last week and had people such as Brenda Croft in the, in, in the group. And Brenda made uh, reference to um, Gary Foley's um, comment, you know, I'm not your expletive uncle. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, there are rules for us around uh, relationships and how we, how we perform those relationships. Um, sometimes I feel some of the, um, the key um, concepts in our life are used so much, they become overused and the, the um, essence of what they meant in the first place get lost, mm. you know? And I think mm. reconciliation can suffer that as well. Um, you know, it's, it's meaning, it, it, it becomes not so much overused, can you overuse reconciliation? No, but I think the way in which it is sort of lived and implemented within communities particularly when um, dominant cultures feel like they have reconciled enough mm, with yeah. Aboriginal people. Um, I was thinking about one of those other previous co cohorts too. The hardest, the hardest group to work with is, is the group who says, I don't care. I don't care about Aboriginal people. I don't care at all. That's, that's really quite shocking you know, um, when you meet that cohort of people. Yeah, or if they, we get sometimes a comment about get over it, you know, mm. that kind of uh, scenario. I mean, yeah, I'm still waiting for um, Anzac Day to be per se in that yeah. regard as well, you know. Yeah. Well, that might be a good opportunity to ask one of our more you can't ask that questions. If we are to believe that everyone is equal and everyone should be treated the same, then why do Indigenous Australians ask to be treated differently? Plead the fifth. <laughs> it's, it's the myth of liberalism. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is the myth of liberalism mm. that everybody is treated the same. And we know that that's not true. Um, if everybody was treated the same, we have, wouldn't have different classes within Australia. Um, you know, and class is very much linked to, you know, the income that you earn, yeah. um, the power of capitalism yeah. within yeah. a democratic society. Yeah. You know, we're not treated equal. People aren't yeah. all equal. Yeah. You yeah. know, so that's that's part of the myth of liberalism. You know, it's also that mythology. Um, it, you know, I think that situates it really well with that mythology about I don't see colour. Yeah. I mean, Aileen Morton Robinson, distinguished professor, she was the one who taught me. Well, how can you deny colour? You have to see colour first yeah. <laughs> to then deny it. Yeah. You know, the, these are sort of the. Um, these are sort of the discourses um, of um, the privileged within um, dominant culture to be able to speak in that way. I mean, we, we know that there is no, yeah, <laughs> that yeah. if there's no, and, and some days where, you know, we know that we are, we, not some days, we know that we are in that constant struggle of trying to even gain equivalence. Exactly, yeah. And it's always also that, uh, I mean, our voices is not all that loud as all well, as well, you know. Um, Auntie Lilla and Auntie Mary in her classes uh, have said that, you know, the terms of uh, reference is often held by the, uh, uh, the dominant culture. In this case, you know, the invaded, invading culture. So they determine what everyone sees or hears, uh, you know, through their, their mass media, multimedia. Like our megaphone as, as you know, as a people, is only small, whereas, you know, the, the politicians, are, um, the shock jocks, the, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, their megaphone is massive uh, as well. So, I mean, we, what chance have we got of changing people's thinking compared to, uh, you know, what, what they have as well? And, uh, you know, in just making clear, you know, what we feel or where we're at. Mm. I mean, previous generations worked so hard to be treated equal. Yeah. 
and not to stand out, not ask for anything special, just to be treated equal, and were denied equal treatment. Mm. And, and I guess it's, we're fortunate we've got this younger generation that are just have been brought up to be proud, to be mm. Aboriginal. And that scares white Australia. Mm. And, and also the, it's the younger generation that have helped make the older generation that were conservative to bring them out and help make the older generation more vocal mm. about what they were denied when they were young. Mm. All right, so the next question are from a non-Indigenous person who would like to know, how should I call out racism and, dis racism and discrimination without potentially causing more harm? So I thought maybe white knighting, bit of a mission manager. Mm. How do you approach that? How do you call out racism and discrimination without potentially causing more harm? Well, it's something that they have to do within their own community. If mm. they're sitting around the table with their mum and dad and their racist dad says something, then, uh, I mean, yeah. they say, hang on, dad, it's not like this, you know. Uh, I mean, that's at one level, yeah. of, of course, you know. Um, I, I like when you see what happened, um, you know, with Adam Goods, you mm. know. Yep. I mean, that is so extreme where Adam Goods called out racism and then copped a hell of a racism oh, yeah. because of it, you know, as well. What should have happened then is that uh, the, the little girl who had done that uh, racist, said that as racist things, yeah. it should have happened then and then, then stop. See, like, if these things are often mm. nipped in the bud or happen, you know, uh, right from when the yeah. kids are young, you know, through our education system, one particular work that, that always uh, I think about quite a lot, you know, in, in working in a positive way, you know, towards affecting people's humanity is that the work of Gordon Bennett's uh, where yeah, called Daddy's yeah, Little Girl, where he's got Daddy sitting back and then you've got this little girl moving these blocks around with letters spelling Abo, Coon, Darky, you know, uh, these very derogatory terms and uh, to me, that is kind of like the genesis of uh, where these mm. things happen. Uh, I mean, if that little girl was moving these blocks around to, to represent these positive, powerful, wonderful things about Aboriginal people, maybe, you know, that could be the, the yeah. Yeah. you know, the, the initial scenario. But, yeah. but Adam Goods, I think the incident, you know, he, he pointed at that girl. Yep. and said she was racist. Yeah. Mm. Racists don't like being pointed at. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and in a sense, racist, they gave it back to him. That's mm. the sad thing. Mm. They made him suffer for pointing. And yeah. I wonder to what extent how many non-Indigenous people see things like that and then question whether they can even step in themselves. And I think what you said about, you know, you've got your pet grandparents sitting at the dinner table and you've got, you know, non-Indigenous, they go online, yeah, you've used Miange and is that a Brisbane, but what are you doing with your family? Yeah. But, uh, can, I, can I add a, uh, yes. um, another thought into that? Um, each and every day for us to be within this country requires um, enormous courage. It calls upon us to have strength of conviction about who we are as Aboriginal peoples, to have such a strong belief in our own sovereignty that it is absolutely unquestionable. So every day, that's the armour that we slap on before we walk out the door. Now, what I want to know for that young non-Indigenous person who's going to call out um, racism, I want to know that they will, whether I'm present or not, that they will have equal amounts of courage, not stupidity. I don't ever want anyone to put themselves in harm's yeah. way. Yeah. But I want to know that they have, they have equals amounts of courage to be able to stand with me. So, and have truth in their own convictions. 
So if they are tell if you are telling yourself, I understand the concept of social justice. I understand that this world needs to be better, and particularly for Indigenous, our First Nations people, then um, um, you, um, there's a shift in your body when, when you know that, that what you have done is right. It's not, um, and I suppose that's, that's one of the really wonderful things that um, you get to grow up with, or I certainly grew up with, is older people within your family demonstrating that every single day. You know, whether it was our mothers dressing us up to the nines before we went to the shop to make sure no one's going to say there's dirty black kids there, you know. Um, you weren't allowed to cough, you weren't allowed to misbehave or anything. God, you got it when you got home, you know. To, um, to sort of meet that society that we were, we had to engage with on our terms, equal terms, you know? And, and that took courage every single day, every single day. So if you do see yourself as having a social justice ethos, if you do you see yourselves as truly understanding, you know, what diversity means, if you think deeply about an acknowledgement of country and what that means for you as a non-Indigenous person to live on Indigenous country, then um, stand with us and show that courage. Yeah. All right, another you can't ask that type question. How do you feel about people identifying as Aboriginal when it is a far distant relative, i.e. a great grandmother, <laughs> and the person and family do not have any current cultural connections to community? <laughs> I'm laughing because this was a conversation that we were having before the camera started rolling. But you can't ask that. <laughs> but you can't ask that. But I did. <laughs> Plead the fifth. No, look, I think it's a good... I, I, look, it's, it's a difficult... We're dancing around it because of the politics of that particular question. Um, but it's a good question. All right, next one. Oh, another one. Is it okay for non-Indigenous people to wear Indigenous branded clothing? Flag t-shirts, Vernon's, text t-shirts. What do you reckon? Oh, I'll be in favour of that because that means um, They've bought money. To us, <laughs> first of all, yeah. Uh, but also, yeah, like it's kind of a symbol of uh, uh, solidarity, I mm. guess, in a, mm. in, in a certain way. So. Um, even, you know, for non-Aboriginal people, you know, despite all the politics that's yeah. happened, you know, just with the Aboriginal flag as well, you know, yeah. like... Because mm -hmm. I thought that would be a good yeah. question for you, yeah. obviously, with one of your banners, you've got Whiteout, Wham, so that was a non-Indigenous clothing company that bought the exclusive world rights to the Aboriginal flag, and they've been sued before for selling fake Aboriginal art. So I thought, yeah. Yeah, well, well I mean, that, that's just how terrible this, how the system is and how it's kind of stacked against mm. us in a way where where we have this guy who had been ripping off, um, you know, uh, Aboriginal artists and passing off Aboriginal artefacts and things like that as, as being uh, authentic, you know, for, you know, a, a, and making millions of dollars from that. Then, um, then he gets sprung, goes to court, he gets fined, and then he declares back bankruptcy and then changes the, the trading name and still doing the same thing that he had done previously, but, you know, in a different guise, so, you know, um, and, and then, you know, uh, in regards to Aboriginal flag, you know, like, I mean, it's a fantastic uh, design and it's quite powerful and, uh, you know, and it does belong to Harold Thomas, you know, really, uh, I feel, you know, uh, Harold Thomas should be a multi-millionaire, you know, uh, he should have his factory uh, uh, that only puts out Aboriginal flag paraphernalia and, uh, in the Aboriginal, and he should, uh, you know, have the money, and perhaps it should uh, go to Aboriginal communities. Because the moment I seen that happen, where the, the where the uh, uh, rights was sold to, was given, uh, you know, to uh, Biribu, is it Biribu, 
Bureau of Bay Arts, or, mm. and then they, you know, uh, were kind of policing the reproduction of it uh, and ensuring that, you know, Harold Thomas gets his royalty and they get their cut as well. But you know, with Harold Thomas saying that, you know, we as blackfellas can paint the Aboriginal flag, you know, uh, we can use the Aboriginal flag, but we can't reproduce it to, to you know, um, mm. to make money from it, I guess, you know, like, I mean, he has a point in that regard, but to let, you know, this, um, what I'd call kind of not so ethical person have those rights, that to me is, uh, you know, is the crime. And, and my work is just about, you know, you know, the white out of, uh, of, of, um, of our Aboriginal movement, um, it kind of uh, takes away our power in a sense that he has that, simply because all the blackfellas, all of us that marched with that flag, what we are in fact doing was promoting that design and that image. Mm. So really, all of us are blackfellas should send an invoice <laughs> to Biravai <laughs> Arts for, uh, uh, for promotion of that particular work, you know, because really that does not, you know, belong to him. It actually belongs, as far as I'm concerned, it belongs to us, to us, uh, us as a people. Hmm. You know, we don't need government legislation hmm. and law to actually uh, to, to say that, you know. But having said all that, I still um, respect uh, Harold Thomas's rights um, to determine, you know, uh, his design. But then, you know, it's only a design and uh, it's not, you know, a flag uh, in the regard how, how um, people see flags, I guess. Um, did anyone add anything to that? No, because, no, that's deadly. Um, you yeah, go. Uh, yeah, anyway, look, I mean, the whole notion and concept of flags, they're like shrouds anyway. Uh, like, um, before invasion, we didn't have a flag, did we? No. no. So, you know, like, I mean, the, uh, right now what's happening in Palestine, you know, with the Palestinian flags, uh, when I was over there, uh, a lot of the Palestinians did not agree with that flag simply because they said it's only recent, but they will use it anyway because it unites mm. them. And it's uh, much the same when you look at all their different nations there. That flag served its purpose, um, you know, and it still does, of uniting us and, and making us much more powerful than what we would otherwise be, I guess. But uh, yeah. does that partly answer no, that? No, that answers it. I think that's great because we're just about out of time. So in one word, to, to wrap this up, in one word, what is one action that you would like to see every non-Indigenous person who attends this conversation, either online or in person, take away today to contribute to reconciliation? So true one word. Yeah, one word. Uh, Aboriginal eyes. That means see things Aboriginal way. Agency. Have agency. Uh, learn. <laughs> <laughs> That's usually the big one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so big thank you to our three panelists for joining us today. Gordy, Tracy, Michael. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you with us and to share in your thoughts and your stories. I think I can speak for all of us that we're going to leave a little bit more knowledgeable. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gordy. And last but not least, thank you to our audiences, both here and online. Thank you for joining us and thank you for submitting such fantastic questions.